So today I'll talk about a program intended to galvanize the nation behind Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal and how it became a part of America's war machine and in the process created one of the most impressive and important photography um, collections of the country in the country. Um, in 1935, the federal government uh, began the largest photography project um, ever sponsored by the United States. Over 170,000 photographs uh, were archived depicting daily life um, in America uh, under the direction of the Farm Security Administration and the Office of War Information uh, from the Great Depression through World War II. Um, so first I want to start off with how did photography become a project of the federal government? Um, the Resettlement Administration, as you see here, a poster, um, was a New Deal federal agency which began in 1935 and was charged with resettling farmers on uh, viable lands uh, and providing low interest loans as well as building relief camps, as you see here, um, cooperative farms, and suburban homesteads, and this was a homestead built in Maryland. Uh, unlike the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which, which had primarily aided well-established farmers, uh, the RA was to help the poorest third of farmers uh, who were being displaced. Uh, directed by Rexford Tugwell, a Columbia University ec economist, the RA came under immediate scrutiny. Uh, realizing the battle for public opinion had begun, uh, Tugwell hired his former student, uh, Roy Stryker to lead the historic section with the information division of the RA. Uh, photography became the tool of the day. Uh, the, historic set out, uh, the historic section set out to document um, the administration's success as well as the continued need for programs by phot photographing America at her most vulnerable. This visual material was made available uh, to government agencies, newspapers, magazines, publications, books, and museums. Commenting on the climate of the nation's capital, Stryker stated, there was an exhilaration in Washington, a feeling that we, uh, things were being mended, that great wrongs were being corrected, and that there were no problems so big they wouldn't yield to the application of good sense and hard work. By the end of 1935, back, so this is one of the most famous photographs of the Depression. Uh, by the end of 1935, Stryker had hired four photographers who would go on to create some of the most iconic images of the era, as you see Rothstein's photograph here. The battle over the imagination of America would now be fought on a new scale within the federal government through photography. And this is Rothstein who took that previous photograph. One of the first photographers was Rothstein. Um, and he um, started doing uh, projects all over the country. And as you can see here, is it some images of them trying to show rehabilitation. So the house on the right being rehabilitated on the right. Um, but in the photograph below, these, this family is going to be moving into these new farms in Georgia. Um, next, Carl Meidens and Walker Evans perhaps one of the most famous photographers of the uh, 20th century documentary photographers, came on board, followed by uh, Dorothea Lange, who took the most iconic image of a uh, photograph of the era. And this is uh, Walker Evans' photograph from um, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, James Agee's book um, that he worked with on James Agee. And this is Dorothea Lange um, with her camera on top. It's a great photograph. And then the, probably the most iconic photograph, Migrant Mother. As photographs began to flow into Washington, political turmoil set in. Hired in the throes of the election year, Stryker watched the new organization become drastically restructured as the resettlement administration came under criticism and Roosevelt worried about winning the 36th election. Despite the support of Roosevelt, though, uh, members of Congress labeled the resettlement administration as socialistic and ineffective. And uh, resettlement of poor urban and rural families was abandoned. And the FSA, the Farm Security Administration, was created, um, which took over the Resettlement Administration. Uh, Stryker's historical section went with it. Uh, now under the, sorry. Now, um, so the FSA um, gets going in around late 36, early 37, and this photography unit keeps traveling with it. Now under the Department of Agriculture, Stryker set out to educate his phot 
photographers about the socioeconomic forces at play in the US and then sent them out in the field. This is Carl Maiden, one of the staff photographers. For example, when Maiden was assigned to photograph uh, cotton in the South, Stryker made sure Maiden understood the historical, the history and production of cotton in the US. Uh, recognizing Stryker's role in, in directing these photographers, uh, famous photographer Ansel Adams, well known for his photographs of the American West, uh, quoted, what you've got are not photographers, they're a bunch of sociologists with cameras, and that would prove very helpful going into the war. Uh, photographs circulated nationally, and um, books uh, use these units' photographs. Images such as Migrant Mother um, nowhere, nowhere. Uh, took hold of the nation. Museums and the high art community actually embraced these photographs. The Museum of Modern Art did its first, first photography exhibit ever in 36, displaying Walker Evans' photographs. So it gives you an idea of the prominence that photography is starting to play, both nationally and culturally. Um, important to note is that the FSA photographs were not alone. Photographers, sociologists, and writers were partnering together to produce photography books and articles about poverty in the U.S. Um, and sort of as this, as this plethora of material came out, Stryker decided that in, he wanted to change the vision a little bit. Seeing the potential of the unit, Stryker decided to expand the FSA's vision. Um, he had already begun to do this. As long as, they, uh, as long as they included photographs that Stryker wanted, he actually allowed the photographers uh, to take um, any photographs that they wanted. Um, thousands of photographs started to flood DC. Um, and this is actually New Orleans in 36. And these are the type of images that start to come in, focusing on small towns and other areas. This is perhaps another really famous photograph, um, Guy's Bend by Marion Post Wolcott, one of the few female photographers. Stryker began to tell the um, photographers not just to depict poverty and progress, he told them to depict um, not the America, oh, actually I just love this photograph because it's sort of ironic. <laughs> Next time, try the train. And here you see the articles in the papers. So Stryker, as he expanded his vision, um, decided, st st stated um, to his photographers to depict, quote, not the America of the unique, odd, or unusual happening, but the America of how to mine a piece of coal, grow a wheat field, or make an apple pie. In other words, to capture daily life. He wanted America to see and understand herself. Uh, Stryker stated, a good documentary should tell not only what a place or a person looks like, but also tell the audience what it would feel like to be an actual witness to the scene. He sought a quote, a, pict a pictorial record of America, uh, not just for the era, but for future ge generations. And with this expanding gaze, he sent photographers across the nation, um, individual photographers, um, expanded the gaze to urban areas as well. And as you see here are images, this is the DC offices where they're starting to take all these photographs in. And they were filed. Um, about 60,000 photographs were actually printed of the 170,000. They would place them on these cards and anybody could go in and you can actually to this day still go to the Library of Congress and go through these, exact, these files. They're organized almost exactly the same way in filing cabinets. So by 1939, though, Stryker began to worry. Uh, Hitler's ascent to power was troubling. The invasion of Poland in <laughs> September of 39 and his resulting pact with Stalin and Mussolini was the realization of many's fears abroad and at home. The U.S. history of race relations and current poverty was prime material for the German and Soviet Union's propaganda machines, which actively set out to undermine America's claims to protecting the free world, themes they adamantly denied about themselves. And then here you see, this is sort of the change to middle class life that began to take hold of the archive. 
Um, you can see all the Life magazines. Those are the type of magazines that would have been showing these photographs on their covers and in their pages. This is Chicago. As you can see here, the changing, <laughs> the changing vision of, this, of the photographers. This is New Orleans again. And if you know where these are, please come tell me. That would be wonderful. This is a bar downtown, the French Quarter. This is one of my favorite. It's in the nuns walking through the French market. And so this is what started to become a problem for the U.S. was um, Jim Crow South and, and um, segregation um, became prime material. Um, I do like the uh, true story, Hitler's love life revealed. <laughs> um, these are part of these pulp magazines and confessional magazines in the late 30s and 40s made on pulp paper and they would, um, they, they would go on during the war to show um, Americans uh, fighting Nazis in these amazing comics, uh, comic strips basically and um, they're, they're pretty incredible. So. Uh, and as, according to their title, as always, it was a true story. Um, <laughs> but, and you can see sort of the ironies in this photograph of what's going on here. Um, in light of these concerns, Stryker um, began to actively, particularly actively shift the focus of the unit. Uh, in fall 1940, uh, Stryker wrote to photographer Jack Delano, uh, please watch the autumn. Uh, please watch for autumn pictures, as calls are beginning to come in for them, and we are short. Uh, there should be ra they, they, these should be rather the symbol of autumn. Cornfields, pumpkins, emphasize the idea of abundance, the horn of plenty, and pour maple syrup all over it, mixed with white clouds, and put on a sky blue platter. Uh, I know your damn photographer's soul reads, but to hell with it. Do you think I give a damn about a photographer's soul with Hitler at our doorstep? You are nothing but camera fodder to me. Uh, and the left is actually a photo of um, someone uh, peeling, cutting pumpkins for pumpkin pie. Um, Strider, Stryker would later be described as, quote, a watchdog of the national image. Uh, in a popular story recounted about Stryker, he was working in the DC office um, when a man from a German embassy came to see the photographs of the FSA. Uh, worried about his uh, intentions, Stryker had photos of landscapes in abundance placed out uh, for the embassy official to view. Um, Stryker reportedly stated, quote, he was a very pleasant little Nazi. I had no intention of allowing him, allowing the records of America's internal problems to fall into his hands. Uh, Stryker actually later denied the story um, and said it was, an over, it was overdone um, in oral interviews in the early 1960s. But he did acknowledge, um, quote, um, we did some subterfuge, but no refusals. We used our integrity a few times. Um, we used our, um, I'm sorry, our ingenuity a few times. We, claim, we, we damn well didn't refuse. If anybody said we did, they lied in their teeth. I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you that we did some fast leg work a few times. <laughs> so sometimes, uh, sometimes story got out of control and sometimes uh, l later in age you remember it a little bit differently. Um, to what degree Stryker manipulated the photographs for viewers um, is unknown. But Stryker's uh, concern about the potential and the, pa uh, the power of these photographs uh, was real. Um, and actually, you can see uh, this making a war poster. And they actually use these photographs for these posters. Um, and I think there's some work to be done for people to look at all these posters and see 
compare them against the file about the, a lot of these images may actually are based on real people. Um, and I know that would be very exciting if I found out that was my family member. So I think that would be, a, there's some work to be done there to see perhaps uh, to what so, uh, some of these posters, and you can see his work down here with the photographs. And there, there were just tens of thousands of photographs by this point to work with. Um, in the month leading up to Pearl Harbor and its aftermath, uh, Stryker set out to shift uh, the image of the nation. While he did not abandon the FSA's efforts to document those in need, uh, Stryker instructed his photographers to, to depict, quote, pictures of men, women, and children who appear as if they really believed in the U.S. Get people the little spirit. Too many in our file now paint the U.S. as an old person's home and, and that just about everyone is too old to work and too malnourished to care much what happens. As you can probably get the picture, Stryker wasn't particularly PC. Um, <laughs> With the U.S.'s entry into the war, Stryker's uh, photography unit was then moved over into the Office of War Information, where photographers set out to depict a nation rising. Stryker aimed to offer an image of America as an abundant and powerful nation, an image in contrast to these uh, images of poverty. Uh, Stryker refocused the photographers on the defense in industry, um, a process he actually began as early as 1940. Um, and in earnest in 1941, as war became imminent. It also gives you a feel of these photographs for some of the actually early um, moves in the 40s and 41, even before the US's entry of um, factories starting to come into power as people, um, as the nation came more to a realization that war was, was, was imminent. Uh, an internal war over the identity of the country um, ensued. Uh, with war came major shifts on the home front, including unprecedented migration. Um, estimates are up to 30 million people migrated during the, the war, a, a huge um, movement of people. Um, changing gender roles and destabilization of the traditional nuclear family left many wondering where was America headed and having control over what America might look like after the war. Um, and to give you an idea, here's Higgins Industries. In 1941, it had 400 employees. By 44, it had 20,000 people working. Um, huge influx of labor and um, movement across the South of people moving to port cities to, um, to work in these industries. Um, here is... Um, Willows Run. Um, this was outside Detroit. Um, from 40 to 44, they also they had 200,000 people migrate to outside Detroit. See, um, pretty incredible. Um, and this is an aesthetic you're going to increasingly see in the photographs. There's a light shining from the bottom corner up onto them. And this is, becomes the sort of aesthetic of the photographs into the war as the shift becomes more clearly toward not just depicting daily life, but to be used for very specific purposes. Um, and you'll see more photographs like this as, as the aesthetic really begins to change. And actually, here's, I'm sorry, here's um, Higgins Industries. My apologies on the other one. I like the peace signs on the photographs up here. <laughs> and victory. That's right. I'm sorry. I apologize. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, small towns and urban life changed overnight, um, leaving many trying to figure out what had happened and what it meant for the future. Uh, to give an idea of some of the lack of consensus at times during the war, in 1944, over 40% of Americans in a survey um, said they were unsure why we were fighting. And so these images become incredibly important in galvanizing support behind the war. Um, American exceptionalism came under question as the violence um, 
uh, became a reality and state sanctioned internment of Japanese Americans actually threatened to scar the nation's reputation. Um, and the FSA actually did photograph this as well. However, mirroring efforts by the film industry uh, to depict a noble view of the, uh, of the US Strikers Photography Unit um, set out to photograph a nation united. And then, like the bottom says, um, part of the arsenal of democracy defense plant. And here you can see some images of daily life and them trying to crop them. This is actually them actively cropping the photographs. Cropping oh, sorry. Um, it, process of making, cropping, making the image, cutting the image smaller to frame it how you would like the image to look. Right. Um, a new image of African Americans in the Deep South. Um, as educated, here are some students at Atlanta University, and engaged in industry for the war effort, um, was constructed to counter public ideas about America's race relations. Um, and to give you an idea uh, to the, of the extent to which Stryker went to create a new image, um, he in instructed photographer Jack Delano, who was on assignment, to photograph, quote, soldiers on the street corner, soldiers playing pinball machines, soldiers playing these little machine guns, uh, target practice. I am very anxious that we get additional pictures of the soldiers' life around the towns and the block up of uh, normal facilities uh, caused by the soldiers coming into town on the weekends. You should by all means try to get a hand, uh, try a hand at Phoenix City. Most of the prostitution is on the side of the river Dot, dot, dot. Try to get a picture of a soldier, lonely, trying to pick up a date. Essentially, he was suggesting that images, someone picking up prostitutes could be um, considered a date instead. And um, so, um, so, and here you go. So we all know what that is. I'm going to assume that this is a lovely young lady, but you know, start to always wonder what you're seeing sometimes. Um, attached, uh, attacks on the FSA were not new. And then by early 1942, commercial farm interests, uh, which included powerful senators such as Harry Byrd of Virginia, began to mount another round of attacks. Uh, several budget cuts began to cripple the agency. Stryker and his photography unit began working underneath the Office of War Information, which preferred clear, uh, photographs that were clearly propaganda. And you can start to see the staged nature of these photographs. And this is Alfred Palmer, who um, was very much like to take, I said earlier, this, a singular light and, and shine it at different angles at, at, his, top, at his subject of his photograph. Um, so you can clearly see it right here, the light just coming up from the bottom and through. And um, Look at the men working together. That was a poster the guy was drawing. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. There you go. Even no, better. When you showed yeah, no, that's great. I didn't even notice that. Thanks. <laughs> I'll come back to this. Um, in June 42, um, Executive Order 9182 had the Office of War Information divided into a domestic and foreign section. Uh, by September, the FSA photo pho photograph unit with, went into the Office of War Information into that domestic section. Um, and photographers such as Rothstein and Russell Lee um, joined the ranks of the military, knowing that being drafted was imminent. Um, Rossi went into the Signal Corps, and Russell Lee went into the Air Force. A lot of their photographs for those units will end up becoming a part of the Office of War Information um, photography unit as well. Um, the domestic section was, um, would aggregate several units of photography photographs and file them within the FSA unit. Um, and you start to also see some fun things like this, which was still slides that they took photographs of, of um, different a slide film here. Um, and it's a cute uh, film, uh, slide film in that 
chickens and the eggs are all become recruits and part of the military and they're joining the fight and by buying chickens and by laying eggs and buying the eggs you support the farmer who can buy the war bonds and support all that, support the effort so I thought that was cute um, and as well you see here this is a Victory Corps high school group um, they're on high schools and training as well um, and again, you see this very similar aesthetic of the w light coming in at one angle on the photo. Um, clearly staged, many of them. Um, and that just becomes more and more a part of the archive, a part of these photographs. Um, perhaps uh, the, one of the most incredible legacies of this unit was 1,600 color photos of America during this era. Um, like the black and white photos that captured went from daily life and into the war. This is a woman in Georgia. You can see the similar aesthetic again of the light coming in at one angle, even in the color photographs as well. Coming from the bottom up on the woman's face and up. This is one of my favorites. Uh, Stryker left in October of 43, and, and so with it, uh, the photographic unit uh, dissipated. Uh, in one of his last acts, he guaranteed that the file was moved to the Library of Congress. Uh, by 45, over 170,000 photographs uh, were, were filed um, since 1935. Um, actually, only 60,000 of them were ever printed. And in the 1990s, the Library of Congress went back and digitized all the negatives as well, putting all 170,000 photographs available online. And they're actually in the process of re-digitizing them again um, at archival um, resolution, which means photographs you could blow up and they're absolutely uh, stunning. Uh, and with this, uh, and that is actually when they found the color photographs. Um, Perhaps, I think at its best though, uh, this collection offers a glimpse of daily life across the country from rural farms to urban centers um, and then U.S.'s entry into war. It is not a collection of photographs of politicians, celebrities, or the affluent, but rather a rare glimpse into the lives of those who have labored to make this country. Um, as Stryker stated, Quote, I'd say yes. It was, more of an it was more education than anything else. We succeeded in doing exactly what Rex, Tug Rex Tugwell said we should do. We introduced Americans to America, and it helped connect one generation's Im image of itself with the reality of its own time in history and for the future. Thank you. <laughs>